Cloud Native Development presents new challenges for security teams. Ephemeral workloads are scattered across services, and it's hard to identify resources, monitor configurations, and ensure compliance. Prisma Cloud by Palo Alto Networks is a comprehensive cloud native security platform, delivering full stack protection for multi and hybrid cloud environments. It provides deep visibility, threat detection, and data security, as well as protection for host, containers, and serverless while enforcing policy guardrails. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Prisma Cloud to gain control over your cloud security. Optix has built a platform for SQL-powered security analytics. Extending the OS query agent, Optix collects, aggregates, and analyzes a wide range of system data and makes that available to solve multiple security challenges. Their solution provides visibility across Linux, macOS, Windows, containers, and cloud workloads. Their customers are using the Optix platform for fleet visibility, intrusion detection, investigation, and audit and compliance. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Uptix and be one of the first to see how they've mapped over 500 behavioral rules to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Whether you need to manage bots, protect cloud applications at runtime, stop form jacking attacks, or secure your web applications and APIs, only Imperva offers a unified solution to protect from edge to application and data in one tool. Imperva helps you achieve more, save money, and become more efficient with fewer security vendors needed. Start a free trial today to easily protect your apps and website with Imperva. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Imperva. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. I'm your host, Mike Shima, joined by John Kinsella. Security Weekly listeners save $100 on their RSA Conference 2021 All Access Pass. RSA Conference will be a virtual experience from May 17th to 20th, and Security Weekly will be live streaming that Monday through Thursday in the virtual broadcast alley. We'll be interviewing some of the top sponsors and speakers for the event. To register with our discount code, visit securityweekly.com slash RSAC2021 and use the code 5U1Cyber. We hope to see you there. Do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on one of the shows? Submit your suggestions for guests by completing the form at securityweekly.com slash guests. We read suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. Ah, uh, take a breath now. Now, as listeners may be aware, I tend to uh, harken back to the 80s or perhaps a bit of history. Uh, today, John, I wanted to go back 20 years to May 2001 real quick for a uh, double decade about a double decode vuln. This is like the uh, dot dot slash. It's sort of a, a Morse code for my favorite vuln. And I just wanted to kind of highlight this as, a, as an example of what... Um, a uh, the CGI file name decode error vulnerability looked like and what web application security looked like, you know, 20 years ago, and perhaps ask, you know, what has changed and what hasn't? Um, I'll say really quick on a positive aspect rather than harp on the bad side of things, you know, the, the double decode and then code red a few months later in July of 2001 hit IIS pretty hard. Then came along the, the Bill Gates Halloween document, trustworthy computing effort. And actually since then, IIS had a very strong story about security. So even though we are talking about one of my favorite vulnerabilities of all time, it did instigate what was actually, I think, overall, a kind of a success story in terms of hardening at least one particular code base within Microsoft. Yeah, it took them a while, um, but they ended up really sort of nailing it, like you said. This one really scared me, though, um, when I saw this in the show <laughs> notes. Um, and I clicked on it, and it's funny because this is, the I think, one of the, the original posts. And I'm like, bug track? I haven't seen anything from bug track in a while. Am I, am I missing a mailing list or something? And I looked, and I'm like, IIS CGI what? And yeah, no, it just finally <laughs> saw the date on it. Um, you know, it, it's a lot has changed. Um, and it's funny, I think recently we, we mentioned somewhere around here. Um, well, web shell scripts, right? Which is still sort of a, mm -hmm. a, either a CGI or a PHP based thing, which these are still sort of relatively CGI based, depending on how you're using uh, PHP. Um, but happy to see, you know, a, a lot of things have changed. Um, I, I think, I hope a lot of the stuff that we were talking about back in this point in time, um, you know, wherever we were in the world, uh, has been updated a little bit and become a little bit more secure, but there's still a lot to fix as we've seen. Still a lot to fix. And I will say, too, and aside from the, the nostalgia, the, the trivia of bringing up what happened, you know, 20 years ago this this month, what you hit on there, the web shells, this is one of the other reasons I like to bring up these ideas of the, the 
uh, directory traversal because if you look at some of the flaws here, there was write access to the document root. So attackers could upload arbitrary content. They could read access to the file system or in the case of IIS, whatever volume the, the service was deployed on. And you could actually execute a command shell, either the one that you uploaded yourself as some ASP code, or you could hit the cmd.exe. So all of those aspects actually have a lot of hardening steps that could have been made better. And we see, I think, you know, some better aspects of that when we talk about containers, isolation, removing the ability to call it like a living off the land type of attacker techniques. So even though, you know, going back in a bit of history, I think there are still a lot of lessons for modern applications. And that is another reason why I want to try to bring it around, make it relevant to see what have we learned and what still should we be learning from the, the sins of the past. You know, I think that's a good point. Um, and, you know, we just had uh, Paul Walter guys on, um, a specific guy. But, you know, we, we've, I think where a lot of us as an industry have, at that point in time and since we realized, we're not going to be able to fix all these issues. So what can we do to isolate? Like you mentioned, containers, you know, not full security isolation, but um, we're, we've made all sorts of leaps and bounds around this. Like back in the CGI days, I think one of the first things um, I remember them doing, at least like for PHP, was um, to put each... Uh, requests either into a separate process or a separate thread to try and minimize right. the, the um, cross-contamination. And we've done a lot of things in that side, which I think has been really helpful. Uh, cloud wouldn't exist the way it is today right now if we didn't have some isolation between and allowing <laughs> multi-tenancy. Um, but yeah, it's whack-a-mole, right? We fix one thing and then something else either pops up or we start focusing on it more than we did before because the bad guys realize, hey, well, that stopped, so what else can we do to get in there? Indeed. So I think now, though, let's let's switch gears from the, the ancient history of web application security into something that's actually quite more modern. And uh, I don't it might have some parallels and protocols and in, 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 in such, but air tags. So air tags uh, definitely in the news recently because uh, Apple just had some big announcements about all of the, the new the new Macs, the new iPhones, the new capabilities, including air tags that are coming out. I think it was just last episode. Episode we were, uh, or an episode or two ago, we were talking about uh, a, a write up about AirDrop and some privacy settings and the protocols around what the AirDrop protocol can reveal or not reveal for that matter. In this case, there's a lot of focus on AirTags in the sense of what are the threat models around them. And there's a couple things that I'll just kind of seed here and then we can explore from there. One is that Apple has done a pretty good job of explaining some controls around. What happens if you have a lost or a not so lost, but a placed air tag about you or on your person? Uh, it, it will it will actually start to beacon out, but it will only beacon out after a couple days, three days right now by default. And it's primarily going to be part of a threat model that helps you if you're within the iPhone ecosystem. So you could still use an Android phone once a air tag is in loss mode and you could tap and see who, you know where it's lost, who it belongs to. But a lot of the warning, a lot of the to be clear, anti-stalkering aspects uh, right now seem very focused on a long time frame and focused on you have to be on the latest iPhone iOS and be in within that ecosystem. So I think these are some pretty understandable concerns and it's kind of interesting to see what this type of new technology and new use of technology is, is creating in terms of threat models and the application and the product security discussions around it. It's, um well, first, you mean we're not going to just talk about drilling a, a hole in an air tag because we're too cheap to go and buy an actual keychain? Um, <laughs> now that I got that out of the way, uh, I've got friends doing that, unfortunately. And and, and hey, nothing wrong with it, but it's, at least to me, there's something wrong with it. It's, I think the interesting thing here is for a company that's so good at controlling their um, messaging and, and what they put out there and thinking about privacy, this seems like a fairly big slip. Um, it'll be interesting to see, just purely from a messaging and marketing and business point of view over the next six weeks, how this changes. I think it was on Apple's radar, and that's why there's been a little sort of, um, you know, that, that three-day period, as you said, can change. Uh, unfortunately, it changes at Apple's will, not at everyone else's. So we'll have to see sort of right. how this uh, evolves over the next month or two. Um, you know, for a lot of people, that's a really huge deal. Um, so... 
Uh, and also, you know, sort of vaguely related to this, I think we're going to be talking a lot more about Bluetooth over the next few weeks, too. So there was another announcement out. Um, I believe it's uh, Amazon Sidewalk Network, which we've covered briefly before. They're mm-hmm. expanding that so that Tile and some other guys can go on there. And then I think there's one more of those mesh networks out there. But anyways, there's more of this stuff coming. So as as the bad guys think and ponder around uh, what they can do with this, we're probably going to be covering this more. I think so. And there's a lot of fun angles that cover on it, too. As I was reading up on some of the, the ultra-wideband specs and et cetera and the yeah. technology behind it, it, it was pretty fun because I was dusting off some of my own EE background and, like, uh, talking about uh, antennas and radiation patterns, et cetera, and some of the modulation uh, techniques that are used just for these at the physical layer, for these devices to connect each other. But to kind of bring it around to either air tags or just, you know, Amazon Sidewalk, as you're describing, there's also a lot of the aspects of the pervasiveness and the the uh, how far reaching these aspects are. So, for example, I think the the tile has similar tracking, you know, little gadgets, but that's on the order of magnitude of I think a, a, a few dozen millions. I think maybe thirty yeah. to forty million in terms of adoption. Whereas if you turn to Apple's massive ecosystem, you've got roughly a billion devices out there that could be even in a even with a privacy preserving mode of individual phones detecting individual air tags you don't know which phone identified which air tag the, their identity is mutually concealed from each other but it could make it quite easy to b- have a far more reaching ability to drop an air tag onto someone and follow them far more than a few hundred feet into excuse me, a matter of miles, a matter of, you know, a a full citywide tracking. And I think that is sort of the scale of this is one of the big things that definitely makes this different. So it's uh, it's, it's going to be an area that we we talk about and we we pay attention to for quite a while, I believe. Yeah, yeah. There's also some inf- some things that we'll be paying attention to in hardware and firmware, because not only did we have some, you know, Apple AirTag uh, teardowns, I threw the, some links in there in addition in, into the show notes. Uh, there was also some research onto some Qualcomm phones. And so this was looking at a system on chip. So this is a um, system on chip modem used to manage the, the basically the radio layer uh, on a lot of any Qualcomm devices that are using this chip. And what some researchers from Checkpoint did is poked around at it, and rather than try to attack the modem from the radio layer in terms of trying to get some fancy SMS or getting into their uh, uh, software-defined radio to try and spoof for or play about with uh, the protocols it's receiving, they went from the Android layer. And they were successful, found a a heap overflow that essentially turned into the ability to say, we can bypass the integrity checking that's part of Qualcomm's trust zone enforced by the chipset in order to basically run some arbitrary code that could inspect SMS, which for those of you thinking of OTP challenges in MFA, there's one threat right there, as well as it could get into voice, et cetera. So pretty interesting there. And I think the one other thing before I run out of breath as I'm describing this is that it will be interesting to watch here in the sense of how does this get patched, both in the question of am I vulnerable and do I need to get patched? Because we're not looking at the Android ecosystem so much as the Android device ecosystem. So it's one of those challenges of application security is in the sense of how do I, how, where do I go for the patch and how do I make sure my systems are patched and up to date? Yeah. It's one of the tricky things once we start having so this is the this is the radio sock it's still not the main sock on these uh phones i believe right you're still going to have a um whatever else a m4 what have you um excuse me a, a a4 a7 a9 whatever they're up to nowadays uh but so the reason i mentioned that is you know think back to like intel txt or um intel me uh these things which as they're not the core main CPU, they're not getting as much security attention because that's not what we're interacting with or what we think we're interacting, right? We're, we're definitely interacting with it a, a ton because that's your communication center. But i um, glad you mentioned the, the, the patching aspect. That was in my mind. I was looking at something over the weekend. I think it's a, a knockoff version of, excuse me, a compatible version of uh, <laughs> Philips Hughes lights, uh, which sell for a fraction of cost. But one of the comments in a review which caught my attention is, is this thing going to be patched in the firmware kept up to date, like on a on the main product? 
Um, and in that particular case, I guess the Philips Hue um, hub will uh, manage uh, firmware updates for uh, the Philips branded controllers, which pl- which connects to the hub. But it ain't going to do that for third party. So mm-hmm. not quite a, a direct sto- relation here, but still that idea. If you go for uh, maybe a, a cheaper phone or a phone that doesn't have a, a really big name brand radio in it, is it going to get the same level of security support? So that's interesting to think about. Probably not as big a deal in phones, but still definitely interesting to think about. Still, still good to think about. And I'm glad you 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 pull that in too, because here I was looking at this and thinking of uh, that software bill of materials sense of just mm. what is composed of this. If if at least that would give us a way of asset inventory from the the user's perspective. But I don't know that there's much there. But it's more of just what is the the security cost of having an outdated phone, or in the sense of do I have to buy a new phone rather, or do we you know can I get a patch somehow um so good point i guess that's the best i can say john <laughs> very well done i'm going to use that to talk about one more firmware um aspect and this is actually more of a device driver that's used to update firmware but this was a another security researcher playing around with some dell hardware dell um uh, device drivers and th- this one just kind of stood out on two particular themes one we talked about where this, the, this episode is hitting on a bunch of sort of that hardware firmware side of things and flaws with long lifespan. So in this sense, here was a researcher who found some vulns and these vulns had been around for what, or at least affected software that's uh, up to 12 years old. So it kind of hits what that I think is kind of what you were describing just now in the sense of yeah. IOT, how what's the support lifecycle from either from the the main provider or that third party environment that itself or a third party provider. So not so much interesting here in terms of Dell, et cetera, and so on, but just that sense of device drivers, uh, long standing vulns, and to tie things to try to tie it back. We had talked back in episode one forty seven about Linux kernel moving in, in, you know, adopting Rust in its code base, Rust, of course, being a memory safe and that property being a desirable aspect to use it rather than C. And device drivers have been a notorious source of insecurity. So I think this, you know, is a bit tenuously related to, to Dell, the Windows ecosystem, but in the principle of what an attack surface looks like and, and where our, you know, prominent threats are, this kind of reinforces that good choice to say, Let's do something different in the way that we're writing our code. Yeah, it's you just reminded me. Um, one of my problems the last few weeks is during the weeks I'll I'll get stories to cover on the news here, and I'm not always getting them into our, our, our news queue. And one of the ones that hit me last week was um, I think it didn't it didn't quite rank well enough to get mentioned, but I guess now it does. Um, <laughs> it looks like the malware authors are starting to rewrite some of their malware in Rust, uh, not so much from a security point of view. But because it it looks like, and I didn't, there wasn't enough meat behind the articles, probably why I didn't put it in there. But they're rewriting their, some of their malware in Rust, and they're finding that it's actually harder for the AV systems to detect it. Um, so I- interesting, right? They're looking at it from security, but from a slightly different point of view. But back on this article, um, it's a good write-up. It's like, you know, both of us, we're, we're fond of these media write-ups to start looking at a um, device driver code levels type stuff. So this is good from that point of view. Honestly, when this came out last week, um, I, I mostly ignored it because I'm like, oh, yay, another Dell firmware update. I guess right. it's been a while since we've seen them, and this affects a ton of machines, but... As you said, you know, Dell supports pretty good uh, once they admit there's a problem. Didn't mean quite so snide there, but is what it is. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a big deal. I know there's a lot of people I heard over the weekend that are, you know, scrambling around trying to figure out how they're going to deal with this. Um, and it's, again, the device drivers come back and bite us. They will. And um, to in, in a confluence of, of events here, if you go back and look at the article, look at the disclosure timeline here, there was one comment from Dell that says no patch will be available because, or they're not going to bother patching one of the vulns because the software is deprecated. And I think that goes back and speaks to just what you're saying about uh, mm-hmm. you know the IoT environment. Will we get patches? Will they be backported? So, um, yeah. Uh, important questions there. And I think that's going to give me a chance talking about backporting patches and the long-lived vulnerabilities. I pulled out a uh, 
article about Exim from Qualys. Now, we talked about this back in the uh, uh, fall, I think August, September, I can't rem quite remember, uh, of 2020 when the, the these were these vulnerabilities were first announced. But I wanted to revisit it because they, you know, Qualys updated their blog post, talking a bit more about it. S near, near the end, it becomes a bit salesy. But at the beginning, some of the things that stood out was that these vulns came out of a, quote, thorough code audit. And to me, that kind of speaks to the idea that, yes, we do like, as application security practitioners, practitioners seeing code audits, whether they are done by humans, manual code audit, or done by SAS tools, DAS tools, or SCA, depending on what angle you're hitting, code written by others, code written by yourself. Uh, but these vulnerabilities reach back all the way to 17-year-old versions of Exum, and yet you know, nobody had found them until Qualys had these researchers dove in and took some good scrutiny there. So it's just kind of pretty interesting in the sense of not so much nihilism that we can't find everything, but a good reminder that humans aren't necessarily great at inspecting code. So we do need some automation to back it up. But clearly, over 17 years of automation for a popular open source application like Exim, we need some smart humans to look at that code as well. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I mean, these guys, it's always fun to see the write-ups from Qualys. It's a, it's a sharp group of folks there. Um, and, you know, like this is, what was it, three episodes back, four, where I was saying, don't run your own mail server? It, yeah. You know, I, I hate to bang on that drum, but um, let's see, you just said, oh, yeah, yeah. Another thing I've been reading, um, and again, it comes back into what we were just saying about how do humans do code review on this type of stuff. There was a stat out from, um, and it's not new, uh, from the guys over at SmartBear. Uh, you know, they they do uh, Swagger and a few other things in that sort of uh, application management and, and documentation and security space. But they've done some studies with uh, uh, Cisco and some other orgs showing that if a, uh, a developer or a code reviewer is going to be optimal, they shouldn't be doing more than, they should be doing code review for more than an hour, and they shouldn't be, uh, their rate of review should be less than 400 lines of code per hour. So I thought between those two, um, that's pretty interesting, right? I, I don't remember the spec we used to use back in my professional days when we would, you know, be quoting, building quotes for what it would cost to do a review. Um, but I'm sure I, when I'm going through code nowadays, I'm guessing it's at least double that, so now I have to go and check, because I'm usually just ripping through quickly. Mm -hmm. But that's sort of something for people to think about. We talk about code review, but what does that mean? How fast do you go? What What do you actually, you know, depending on the speed you're ripping through there, uh, that's going to change what you find. Are you looking for the big obvious things or do you focus down on something particular? What do you look for? So um, combining that with this is sort of, you know, it, it's that that's how we find these things or how we stay secure. So it's still important. Still important. And Speaking of finding these things, one of the other um, sites that I mention every few months or so is the, the cyberitl.org. And uh, they're, they're pretty neat because they took uh, an approach to say, what are the ways of hardening the software once it's built? Basically, compiler settings uh, of the binaries. And they were look focused on operating systems, on, on browsers. Um, so consequential areas of attack surface. They're recently, I think, looking at smart TVs, but they haven't updated a lot of their research, but they just recently uh, released the static analysis tool that they use to be, uh, the behind their methodology for saying, how hardened is this binary in the sense of having ASLR, uh, you know, 64 bits, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason I brought it up was I would love to see more of this applied to the modern operating systems just to get feedback. It'd be great to see this type of hardening review applied to the IoT space as well as perhaps more importantly the industrial IoT. That's that sort of angle. And we've even seen in the last couple months, I think it was F5 had a vulnerability where stack protections you know, wasn't even enabled for it. So these types of very simple hardening are still being missed. So I just kind and wanted to throw this in as a tool that, that kind of helps complement the, the manual code review that you were just talking about just now. Yeah, it's, um, sorry, I, I, I made the mistake of getting sucks down. I'm looking for an ASLR, ASMR joke to throw in there, but I'm, I'm getting distracted. <laughs> uh, one of these days I'm going to have that joke. Next up, uh, John Kinsella gives us the <laughs> ASLR speaking. <laughs> I'm telling you there's something there. Um, 
<laughs> no, these things are. It's. I, I think I have become so used to using the commercial tools. Um, again, from the the past life, that I don't give these open source ones as much credit as I should. I mean, I'm using Govet on a on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. um, particularly security modules in there, but still, I don't look at like. I, I tend not to think of using these tools as often as I as I should. Um, they're, I mean, they've improved so much over the last two or three, five years. Um, all these guys are doing a ton of good stuff, so it's 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 highly recommended for people to. If you need something in this space, I mean, obviously you have commercial support and all those type of things, which are very valuable. But at least take a look, see at these uh, when you're going around looking at for either you know stack analysis or fuzzing or any of these areas and um you know I'm, I'm looking at the commercial tools there as well but uh it's it's definitely worth at least spending some time looking at state of the art need to be neat to see that and especially too we've seen state of the art improve with uh ios and pointer authentication codes also helping you know additional countermeasures that could be really strong here so be curious to see that if that that unfold more and i'm going to come back to some compiler discussion but first i want to throw over to you uh, and talk about some maturity models so let's step back for you know a little bit higher than just talking about in the weeds of hardware firmware and compiled languages and uh, uh, maturity models for Kubernetes. Uh, th this this so, one uh, s stood out to you. Yeah, so after this, we'll get back to talking about bytecode optimization, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so this, this I'm putting this in here. I'm, I'm looking for feedback from you if, if you've read through this or from our listeners or anybody. Because um, while this is interesting and it caught my attention, I'm not sure I agree with it. Um, and again, when I do this, I've done this recently with like the VC making some silly statement, which we both agreed against. But I'm not looking to <laughs> to, to chew on a vendor. I'm really looking to mm -hmm. sort of go, is is this a state, or how can we how can we improve this, or help improve, or what does maturity look like? So what this is is a blog post. Let me back up about the Kubernetes maturity model. Uh, so when I think about that, and again, I'm someone who's used Kubernetes now for five years. Four years it's been a while so i think probably you know i I'm, I'm trying to i realize i'm in my bubble i'm trying to sort of look outside my bubble here a little bit um what's i'm a little teapot anyways uh they <laughs> sorry <laughs> coffee's kicked in um Embrace but it. so <laughs> so looking at what what they've got here from phase one to phase seven uh prepare transform deploy and i'm ripping through these build confidence is phase four um improve operations measure control and then optimize and automate uh so phase one and phase seven i agree with i guess when i think about kubernetes maturity um, there's two ways you can think of this, right? One is the first time someone's coming to this, and how do you actually climb that that you know mountain, um, or slab of granite, and get into this? Versus as you become, I suspect where I'm going, what I'm thinking about this, I don't think it's a a linear path. I think um, this is a non-linear curve, uh, and it might be. It's actually yeah, it's going to be that way. So it's um, sort of inverse. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be inverse exponential, right? Um, uh, one over e, I think. Anyways, um, one over e should x. But what? So I guess where there's a really steep initial learning curve here. I mean, the way they talk about, I think this is. And I went and looked at Fairwinds, and they do like Kubernetes stuff. I was looking to see if they were a consultancy, which I don't see because this feels like this was written by someone trying to sell consultant work. Uh, prepare, duh, obvious. We get that. Transform. So I guess from where I'm coming from and where I'd love to hear feedback from others is these first two or three phases, I would consider all phase one, right? Until you've actually done some type of deployment, um, you're you're still at phase one. I mean, thinking about, I, I don't know, I'm having, I'm having a little bit of difficulty here. And maybe it is just there's not seven phases, there's five. But stretching that first piece into three phases seemed like... Um, and then build confidence. I mean, that's something that's always ongoing, right? Uh, and I think, you know what it was when I was thinking through my sauce last week? The first time I do a Kubernetes, the first time I use Kubernetes, or I think most people do, you're either doing kubectl run or kubectl deploy, right? So you're just get something in out there and running. And then as you get more sophisticated or more mature, at least in my mind, you start using um, Kubernetes YAML, then you go use a Helm chart or um, customize or one of these, you know, IACs we've been talking about. And then as you go through more maturity there, you're building out, you know, how do you secure this? How do you secure the application, the IAC? Uh, what 
you know, operations, I think that's sort of the core part of using Kubernetes, right? Is is you're not going to be if you're deploying this stuff by hand, you're you're really low in the maturity scale. So I think what they put as five, I'd put down as like two or three. Uh, measure and control again. I think that's a core part of of a cloud native environment. So maybe it is something you're going to get to. And I think what could be going on here is phase seven goes on for a really really long time. But I would expect. I think most Kubernetes platforms now, excuse me, Kubernetes deployments come with some sort of um, monitoring and measuring and uh, um, uh, introspection uh, capabilities out of the box. So if you're waiting till phase six to use those, that's sort of interesting. Um, so I don't know. It's I'd, I'd love to hear feedback from people. Am I? I could be off my rocker. I haven't actually tried to, you know, write down one through seven myself. I'm just sort of talking it out loud, but still interesting to think about one way or the other. Yeah, love, love love to hear some feedback in a, in our Discord channel. Come by and uh, get, let us know what you think, or if you've adopted a, you know a slightly different model. And my initial reaction was, I think, similar to yours in the sense that that phase one through four sort of seemed just like collapse them into just that initial step of you're doing everything manually, then you're starting to, so you, that you have an idea of here is what we're building, here are some security guidelines we want to make sure we're doing. So you're sort of thinking of it as a, a manual checklist and you're doing it, it manually in the sense of running command line tools, then you're maturing in, in the sense of, as you mentioned, YAML. And then you're building, having that 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 uh, maturity tying the, the implementation and automation of your security controls or your security standards becoming code. And then you're starting to measure and say, how are we doing? Are, is this, does this make sense of, of what we're doing security wise, how we're, we're automating and enforcing the control of it. And then ideally you're getting to the end where you're starting to get to the point where you can say, we've done some neat configuration. We have some default baselines. What can we do to innovate on top of this? And that might be some more advanced tooling. That might be some more advanced uh, mesh networks design, peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, you know, service-to-service -service authentication, those types of things. So I, th there are some, some seeds here that I would think myself I'd use a maturity model, but it doesn't resonate as strongly to me that I would follow it in, in this particular order. But talking about following things in a particular order, I uh, did, did want to end here on a pretty technical article, but I think I can pull us back into some security angles here. So this is a neat blog uh, right up from Cloudflare talking about a conditional an if statement and how optimized can it be? And the thing that came to mind here in the sense of this article was, was one, it's really neat, really well written and accessible. So those of you who are interested in Spectre style of attacks or what's going on within the CPU, check out this article, really, really neat. But the other thing that stood out for me is that the for me, a message here is in your code, aim for readability, which means readable code becomes more maintainable code. Rather than trying to think you have a clever optimization that the compiler doesn't know about or trying to outsmart the compiler, write some code, let the compiler optimize, and then move on from there. So that was sort of the thing that I was thinking out of, of when I was looking at this too. And the sense of what is my security hat uh, in interpreting this as. So I don't know if there's something else that stood out for you in this particular one there, John. Um, it, no, you know, it's, I've had, I've had some interesting thoughts around optimization recently, and I, I'm not, I'm not quite bored enough to always go down the path. <laughs> uh, there, there's another vendor out there that, uh, um, I'm going to leave the name out for now. I've mentioned it before, but um, they they sent a pull request over to um, mm. uh, our my day jobs open source project, uh, Acurix TerraScan. Um, and what what it was was their static analysis tool had found um, uh, there was a potential uh, uh, issue with string comparison, and we really nerded out on it. And I might have talked about this podcast before. I can't remember if I did or not, but we really nerded out on on how does the Go compiler actually break that down. Uh, that string comparison, and it turned out that either way you did it, either the right way or the wrong way, the machine code looked the same. So there's a website out there people can go Google that will, um, it'll you know you punch your Go code into one side, and then you pick your platform and your Go version, and it'll actually show you the byte, the compiled bytecode. So um, our machine code, it was uh, it was really neat to go and look at that. But why I'm bringing that up is there's been a few times recently where I'm either writing code or doing a code review for with the team. 
and I'm looking at something, I'm going, well, that looks like that might not be the best way to say, for example, do a for loop. Actually, it's sort of similar to this, right? And I'm like, okay, does how is the optimi- how is the optimizer actually going to deal with that? So um, I, I think this is this for folks who aren't familiar with the way a modern compiler will optimize the bejesus out of some of this stuff. I think it's a pretty pretty interesting read. It's it's a heavy read, but um, also it just it's it's you know the question comes down to when do you actually care enough to be uh, nitpicky and looking at this, and then you know how do you go about figuring out where the slow code is that you need to work on optimization. So that's sort of the way I think about it. Like, you know, it's, um, can I throw a profiler at it, figure out, you know, what's taking the biggest chunk of time, and then go and see what's going on in there. Is it a memory thing? Or is, you know, is there some loop going crazy that we could short circuit after a few calls or a few other iterations? So this is interesting from a, a, a lower level, and I think it's a good read just to, to think through. But um, as usual, uh, you know, at least for me, it's, bring it back to how does this relate to your day job and, and the type of code you're working on or you know your team's working on it. it i think another interesting aspect here could be if you are on the security side of the house um if you're looking to make recommendations to the dev side from a code point of view or even from a library point of view what does that do to performance um that that's sort of you know we've talked before about embedding security into dev or you know we've thought about it the other way but that's one way to think about it. It's like if you're going to make a recommendation that um, you should be checking for a, a null value at the end of a string, uh, what's the best way to do that that doesn't slow down the application is one very generic example. Um, so I think some of these things are sort of, you know, it, it's it's a good read. It, it's, it's a media read. We've got two of them today. But, you know, think through in the back of your head as you scan through this, um, how does this relate to my team? I think that's sort of a fun experiment. I think that, and that's a great point. And the, the the other aspect that you were really hitting on there too is bringing data to the discussion. You're running, you know, yep. looking at something like Valgrind, where, where when you're profiling the code, where does it actually show it's slowing down? And what was surprising to me in particular from this article was how things varied amongst all the different chips that they were running this on, including what was really neat to see that, you know, the Apple's new M1. So uh, some mm-hmm. really cool, some really cool ways of looking at metrics. And I will say, so I don't be completely dismissive of, uh, from a security perspective, talking about optimizations or not worrying about the compiler, there are situations where you want to zero out a memory space. For example, you've used an encryption key or some other secret, and now you want to clear it from memory. Clearing, zeroing out memory is something that often can be <laughs> optimized out, and it may not be cleared unless you're using some very specific uh, uh codes to do so so uh yeah, always a job. lesson learned and yeah so um i i think in that we've definitely um spent more time on the deep hardware firmware and software that will last us for once in a lifetime and i wanted to bring us back to some talking heads reference and also i just want to say thanks everyone for listening thanks again john for joining me and talking through all these articles we will see everyone next week on application security weekly 